podcast para sa bayan. Of course, uh, today a little bit cozier than usual, uh, but we are hoping to be joined by the rest of the gang uh, in the coming days and weeks as we wrap up uh, this year and we try to do analysis, maybe year-ender analysis, what were the highlights in Philippine foreign policy, and obviously also looking at uh, what are the things that we should look forward to uh, in 2024 or not so look forward to and, or be worried about in next year. Today, again, we're joined by Justin. Thank you very much, Justin, for joining us again. Hello, Richard. Good evening. At magandang gabi also to all our viewers. Maraming salam. It's always a pleasure having you, Justin, there. I mean, uh, of course, folks uh, who have been following you on Twitter and different platforms are... Are pretty aware that you know you're 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 almost as ADHD as me in terms of you know making sure you're always uh, on top of the latest developments. Now, before we go to uh, I don't know our good friends Robin Padilla <laughs> going to SMNI. You know, anyway, before I'll, let's let's talk about what happened over the the weekend, which is uh, a situation whereby two things happen, not one. Right, one is wa water cannoning. Of a roar, of a roar mission, uh, resupply mission to the second Thomas Shoal. That's ne not necessarily the first time that that happened, but I think for the first time we had the military, uh, you know, chief uh, of the Philippines, the armed forces of the Philippines, chief of staff Bronner there. So that kind of makes the situation different. Also, for the first time we had a Christmas convoy of civil society groups going there, and they were really bullied and forced to turn around. Uh, having said that, is this variation on a theme, or we're really seeing? what the uh, National Security Council and some of our friends in the government are calling an escalation. Is, is this something really worrying uh, to you, Justin? How do, what is your assessment of the situation right now? Yeah, actually, I do agree with the characterization of escalation no, for two things. No. Siguro, on the one hand, you know, the tactics have always remained the same. No. So right. this is really the same old problems, no, you know, water cannoning incident, the you know, use of even a you know, acoustic device against the Coast Guard, and also Ang problema kasi this time around, the those tactics led to a collision incident uh, with a Philippine vessel, which China claims to be a scratching incident, right. trying to downplay the significance of that event. Which of course is, uh, from a policy perspective, significant yun kasi we do have a mutual defense treaty with the United States. And it doesn't really distinguish whether an attack is intentional or not. No? So we are really right. looking at whether there is harm done on... Uh, Philippine public vessels, which in this case, actually, to be frank about it, really happened. It just so happened that it's not lethal at this point in time. Mm. But what this does, what this does show us is that the gray zone tactics by China are not actually as safe or yung below the threshold. They're not so gray anymore. Yeah, yeah. they're not so they, they're not so gray anymore. So the tactics can actually be lethal. It actually right. led to the disablement of one of the Philippine vessels, na si Ryan engine. Eh. And additionally, of course, hindi nila, hindi, well, according to the AFP, hindi alam ng China that one of the boats that they collided with and water cannon actually had the chief of staff the armed forces of the Philippines. Right. So in that respect, all of the, all of these tactics by China are finally you know backfiring onto it because it keeps on doing these actions in the past few years. Nobody's opposing it, and now that the Philippines is doing what any proper country should be doing, including resupplying its own military vessels, you know, a force projecting within its own territory or at least within its EEZ. All of these things are routine activities by the state. And China is the one that has deliberately chosen to intercept those missions. So that, I think, is where the escalation is. The tactics remain the same, but China's policy has actually exacerbated the situation. If we, if, if we take mm. a look at the situation, because... So, yung behavior ng China toward the Philippines is actually very unusual. And no doubt about it, it's because it's trying to undermine the credibility of the foreign policy of the current Marcos right. government. If we think about it, China has not responded like this when Vietnam builds some of its military uh, facilities in the South China Sea. China has also not responded like this, for example. To you think, Justin, they're out here to embarrass us? Is this your reading? They're really hard to teach us a lesson. To school yeah. us, kumbaga. Actually, yung embarrassment is only a means to an end. Eh. What does the embarrassment actually show about mm. China's tactic? It's actually adopting a zero-tolerance approach to the Philippines right now. It's not doing that against other Southeast Asian claimant states. Ginagawa lang to specifically uh, para mapahiya yung administration. So that is yeah. really the logic behind it. Um, Now, I, you have a good point because for me, 
we're perhaps somewhere in between gray zone and armata it's a totally new category that i think we have to look at so i can always say the gray zone is a 50 shades but this is a very dark shade that is really just short of armata because it's it's very easy to say oh it's gray zone because it's not armata it's just below threshold but there are levels to below threshold right and this is really reaching the tipping point we're almost crossing the red line exactly. here but at the same time i mean justin doesn't this also expose the limits of the philippine u.s treaty alliance because every time something like this happens including this latest incident which you and i both agree is something of a different order of magnitude and coming from a different policy point of reference they come up with the same statement any arm attack on philippine vessels soldiers aircraft whatever will invoke them okay yeah yeah but obviously that's not what china is doing but it's not like what china is doing is anything like your typical gray zone harassment this is something north of that harassment so may, don't you think this is a time for another i don't know revision of guidelines or even the u.s to change tone because i see friends in dc also coming out and saying it's like yeah i mean like we cannot just you know yeah, the definition of insanity right doing the same thing expecting to get a different outcome because clearly china is not only here to school the philippines it's also here to embarrass us and show the limits of the philippine us alliance uh so either there's something wrong with the alliance or the us itself uh is not willing to 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 appreciate the nature of the threat on the ground i mean what is your reading on this situation the, the implications for the great power rivalry aspect and alliance aspect yeah. I think uh, natin siya in context. No? I think the problem right now with the situation is both the Philippine and the US governments have been very much sold into this idea of assertive transparency being right. the end all be all of the strategies of the West Philippine Sea. Meaning to say, to me tayo with uh, exposing China's uh, aggressive behavior in the South China Sea, to me tayo with just garnering international sympathy. Right. Pero if you look at it on the ground, for example, during these incidents, wala namang specific request yung Philippine side actually from the United States on what exactly is to do. And from right. what I've heard during these recent incidents, the request that came from the government was for foreign governments to issue statements sympathizing with the Philippine position. So the question is, transparency na nga lang ba talaga yung end goal natin mm. dito? So right. it's a question of appropriate ba yung ganong strategy of name and shame to an actor like China, which frankly is shameless. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so said at the same time, yeah. Kaya nga siya, it's engaging in all these behaviors in the South China Sea. It it cannot be named and shamed um, as the ultima ratio ng ng policy natin. So ngayon we're now forced into a question. Ano ngayon yung operational response that is appropriate to this? So, for example, merong questions of whether we should the Philippines should call on the U.S. to shadow Philippine vessels during resupply missions. I think that's a concrete way of trying to operationalize and put teeth to the U.S.-Philippine alliance. Although, of right. course, that's still up for debate kasi nga, ang position ng AFP dito is that all these sovereign missions should be solely conducted ng Pilipinas. Which, to some extent, I would agree to that, no? Um, but different case kasi yung South China Sea merong parts lang niyan yung kiniklaim ng Philippines as part of our territory or as part of our EEZ right most parts of that would be considered as international waters which yun yung tinatry natin to invite actors like Australia Philipp uh, US Japan to conduct military exercises in because kung international waters yun, they should be able to operate in those areas um, without harassment from China so that is um medyo mas okay na nag invite tayo ng foreign presence in those areas which we do also consider as international waters. So, uh, that's um, that's where we stand right now um, with respect to this. But I think yung bottom line talaga dito is kailangan natin ma um, to go beyond this paradigm of, of yung assertive transparency because fundamentally talaga actually, I think mali nga yung, yung naging rhetoric dito ng NTSWPS eh, mm -hmm. about it. Because really, our true strategy sa West Philippine Sea is what we call offshore balancing, right? This has been a similar strategy nung panahon ni President Aquino, which was also co continued under President Duterte, which is to rely on a big external power to help augment yung security forces natin to balance out yung forces on the ground versus China. Which right. is why we're inviting all of these international actors to join with us in an international coalition to help protect Philippine 
uh, territory and its exclusive economic zone. So that is really what the strategy is. So the, at the end of the day, it involves force projection. So it doesn't stop at calling out China, hey, you're doing the wrong behavior. It actually involves we need to leverage on deploying our own forces and if necessary, bringing in other forces as well to increase the deterrent, uh, deterrent value of posture natin with respect to China. Uh, to what degree is this also about because we're all uh, reaching the moment of truth, right? On the Sierra Madre situation. And, you know, I, I, I get your point about Vietnam doing its own militarization. Malaysia, you know, having built its own golf courses in, you know, lying, lying. I mean, I get it. But, I mean, oh, how should I put it? I mean, this, like, the, the problem is that this thing is so publicized that both sides have, you know, dug, in, dug themselves into a position of uh, non-compromise, right? And, and the fact exactly. that we're bringing other powers in... There's also this aspect of China trying to say to its own people and other allies and potential rivals that, hey, we're not going to be intimidated. You can bring in half of the world. We're still going to stand up. And the war, and the more these people you're bringing in are Western, whether Japanese, uh, for them are Western, Australian, American, European, the more this is easy for us to say, this is us against the world. Kind of like how Putin kind of portrayed himself as a victim. Like, like the, one of the most preposterous things in the war in Ukraine is Putin saying, we are the victim. You know, when... Oh, victim, uh, you get what I'm saying? Yung yung mga moves, di ba? So, so I'm just saying, a lot of that is because inadvertently, as we try to publicize the issue more, the more it incentivizes both sides to dig themselves into a position of non-compromise, right? So exactly. it's kind of like a chicken game. Uh, we walk ourselves into a chicken game, isn't it? I mean, that's the worry I have Pero, here. Actually, my response to that, I, I was just writing about this topic, exact topic this afternoon. Na right. Pag tinays natin, no, saan nga ba talaga nanggaling yung, yung escalation spiral na ito? And ako, personally, ha, I think it's a misstep on the part ng China to have continued with these uh, policies of zero tolerance against the Philippines, knowing full well that, you know, kahit hindi naman si President Marcos ang presidente, the Philippines is still going to conduct a resupply mission. Exactly. For the Artichera Madre. Uh, they can downplay it as much as they want. But even during the Duterte administration, 2019, nagkaroon tayo ng swarming incident dyan. Right. The Duterte administration had to respond to it. Secretary Lorenzana had to respond to it. But yung, yung point kasi dyan is, Yung China, because of its yung bagong zero tolerance approach niya to the Philippines, kasi, you know, China has been saying, nakakapag-resupply naman kayo dyan nung panahon ni President Duterte and there was uh -huh. no problem. Which exactly proves my point. In short, yung resupply ng DRP Sierra Madre does not actually have any strategic value for China. Right? We can, the Philippines can resupply the DRP Sierra Madre all we want and China will still have a dominance in terms of the force presence in the area. Right. So actually, for all intents and purposes, China can just let these resupply missions continue and it will not incur any damage to actual, in reality, it will not incur any damage to its military position. But it has chosen to respond to each and every resupply mission and I think that's where the problem is. Kasi it put mm. itself into that position. And recently, meron sa balita na inannounced ni Senator Angara that the Philippines allotted a budget in 2024 to construct a permanent facility sa Ayungin Shoal. Right. So in, in, in that respect, actually, we, we already have all the ingredients for a, a, an impending, frankly, an impending crisis already there. Kasi yung China has already said, you cannot bring in construction materials in that area. Yung Philippines naman, we have been forced into a corner to respond with these kinds of actions. Kasi nga, hindi nga nila pinapayagad yung resupply missions. Eh. So, Basically, they allow nothing, no? Yung nangyari ng last weekend, Saturday and Sunday, China blocked even yung um, resupply mission for Filipino fishermen. No? So that's not even a military uh, activity. That's for Filipino fishermen na binigyan ng oil and gas supposedly dapat ng, ng BIFAR, no? But they also prevented that. So China is signaling to the Philippines this all-or-nothing mindset that we will not allow any activity whatsoever. So kung hindi rin pala ia-allow ng China yung any activity by the Philippines, then the Philippines is more willing to take on risks and gambling. Right, right, And I think right. that's where the escalation spiral is uh, is starting. Eh. Kasi the, the Philippines is being boxed into a position. It's a chicken game. I mean, it's, it's a exactly. chicken game. I mean, this is a classic bully trying to just stare down a smaller country and say, oh, you got your friends. Let's see who your friends are. Let's see what they can bring. 
And, you know, for me, again, the context matters here, you know? And this is where I really blame Duterte. Because one of the worst legacies of the Duterte era was the psychological legacy. Domestic front is the psychology of bara bara drug war. It's the psychology of pwede mong bastosin kahit sinong tao and you're gonna look cool. On the geopolitical front, I think the psychology there was almost the complete opposite. The Philippines is our toy. Diba? That's how the Chinese got We can just manipulate them anyway. We got our guy there in the Malacanang. Like, he, he essentially spoiled China by, by being such a subservient, exactly. pathetically Actually, subservient guy. Think, yeah, exactly. During the, mm. during the Duterte administration, there were so many concessions to China. For example, yung Jemver incident na nabangga yung, yung Filipino fishing, um, mga fisher folk natin doon, no? The Philippine government, including si, um, what's his name, yung dating, secret, uh, dating head ng PDP Laban, si Secretary Kusi, I think, went on the ground to try to... The part of energy things. secretary, yeah. Yeah, to try, went on the ground, tried to smoothen things so that the fishermen don't try to make a big issue out of that uh, situation. I remember so that. So actually, at that point in time, the Philippine government was doing China's work for it, right? Yung trying to do this public diplomacy thing. And they are doing it even without China requesting it. So... There were so many concessions to China na hindi naman kailangan gawin ng Philippine government. And now, yun, yun, yun na yung naging bagong cognitive baseline ng China. Right. It now expects every Philippine government down the line to continue to do the same types of actions, which is of course very unrealistic. Kasi nga, China ended up believing its own propaganda. The Duterte administration, in historical context, is an anomaly. Pero ang nangyari... China is now using the expectations from that anomaly to describe what should be the new normal. Well, but Justin, that anomaly is still around. That anomaly, yes. uh, the daughter of that anomaly is a number two, at least supposedly a media network, yeah. ranting right and left. And that anomaly is still popular. So if you're China, I don't think you're totally ridiculous except your analysis is very low quality. Yeah, exactly. And China, because China can see this, that you know, yung vice president is speaking out against some domestic policies of the president, it starts to think maybe down the line it will yeah. also, she will also do that for foreign policy, right? Yeah. So, I think in, in that respect, hindi dapat nag... I think the government is being a bit chaotic about this. There's no message discipline. So, kaya yung China, if you look at it, it's also... Kung ikaw yung China, you will not really be deterred because you can see that yung Philippine government is fighting amongst itself. Right. So now is the time to capitalize on the weakest link, no? Haharapin ko dito, ano nga ba dito yung, sino dito yung kaya kong ma-intimidate? And if that person that I can intimidate is someone who can change the policy, then I will keep on doing this type of policy. So yung Philippine government, because of all these internal squabbles, all of this, hindi natin tuloy ma-execute yung policy, nat policy natin. We are appearing as weak to China right now, no? So, you know, regardless now of what we think of the Duterte family about the merits of their China foreign policy, I think you act now what they are doing right now in front of China, in front of the whole world, criticizing the administration. This has a, this has a very clear danger with respect uh, to the China policy. Any president naman that's being contradicted by your VP and so forth, nag present ka ng risk of appearing not to have a united front against your adversary, in this case, China. So, essentially, the argument there is that, uh, you know, we can have a debate about the merits of not over relying on America, of calibrating our position towards China, but uh, clearly you cannot debate the negative impact of them acting as spoilers. In this case, the anomaly that was President Duterte, right? This this anomaly yes. is still around. He's, he's ranting, he's raving, he's uh, causing... Uh, he's spreading this information, he's ca causing discord, he's, he's berating government officials, and he's giving this false idea to China that they still got a man in, in not in Manila now, back to Davao, who can they, you can they bring back to the, ca you know, the palace one day, maybe not the daughter, you know, I'm saying, so I see what your point is, that it's the consequences of what the Dutertes are doing, which is very devastating for the country, because, katulad ng sinabi ng mga kaibigan natin na DDS back in the day, bakit di na lang kayo sumusuporta sa gobyerno? Bakit puro kayong nega? Suporta natin ang ating presidente, di ba? <laughs> Yan ang marati kong sinasabi sa kanila, bring and, back you know, to them, to be, right? Yeah. Just to be clear din naman sa mga, sa mga nanonood, I think criticism of government is perfectly fine, but yung specifically what the Duterte family had done in recent months, no, yung Yung pagpunta ni President Duterte in his personal capacity to visit Chinese President Xi Jinping 
Naunahan pa niya si... With no coordination with the DFA whatsoever. Naunahan pa niya si President Marcos at that time na meron tayong tensions with... Um, yeah. Sa maritime tensions with China at that time. So, you know, that is really unprecedented and frankly, uncourteous to the incumbent president. No? Si President Aquino disagreed as much as he did with the policy of President Duterte from 2016 to 2022. You never see President Aquino going to the United States and trying to, you know, say na the president is Philippine president is doing the wrong right. things and so forth, trying to have a private audience with, say, with Obama or Trump. No? Aquino never did any of that. So, I think this is also a learning for other future presidents, not to try to, not to try to undermine um, your, your, the incumbent in office. No? Right, especially really be an expectation. Right, especially in this 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 time, no. Um, well, I would blame also BBM. At some point, BBM should have come out and drawn yeah, drawn exactly. the line. That's the problem with being conflict avoidant. If you're so conflict avoidant, you invite conflict. Yeah, he he, he invited conflict by being conflict avoidant. Because if you look weak, even if he's not weak, I think he has a far better grasp of international politics. I think BBM has been far more courageous on West Philippine Sea than someone who called him a weak leader. But but he should have drawn the, li uh, the line. And the thing is, it's his proxies who are doing that for that. Attacking not the former president, but people around the former president or people closer. So this, this proxy wars, I think the president should have come down and said, hey, the, the country is uh, suffering. This exactly. is not good for the country. So I, I get that point. Ako naman, um, Anong moral and intellectual ascendancy of the, that camp to come and lecture us on West Philippine Sea? They had six years in power. What did they get out of China? Aside from this phantom prevention of war, supposed good thing that they had. Like, China is not going to invade the Philippines. I mean, Aquino took them to international court from 2013 to 2016. There was no war. There was nothing like the Reed Bank incident whatsoever. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence that China will go to war because China is not... Well, they're not, they're not Russia, they're not Putin. They're, they're calculating, they're smart. Time is on their side. So in fact, Duterte was embarrassing Xi and Chinese leaders when he said, no, sabi nila, atakin tayo pag you know, I asserted arbitration award. Like that kind of nonsense, right? That kind of duag policy. Now, now the thing is, the six years, they got no big ticket infrastructure investments. They got no compromise in the West Philippine Sea. Re Recto Bank, Reed Bank incident happened in 2019, the Jember. The Juan Felipe Reef, Whitson Reef happened. So much so that... Uh, that Pacquiao broke away from the president and new faction in PDP Laban came out. These six years, there was no debt trap. Dito mali yung opposition. There was pledge trap. Puro lang pledge lang China. Nothing really coming. So, in short, they have the worst record of dealing with China of any Filipino president I know. I think Arroyo dealt way better with China. I think Ramos karaoke diplomacy was way better with China. He sang karaoke with Jiang Zemin, but at the same time, he'll bring in Americans. At the same time, he'll work the uh, ASEAN diplomacy. As at the same time, he went for AFP modernization. Aquino, I had my disagreements with that administration already there, but at least once the Scarborough incident happened, they woke up, they did their job, they pushed for AFP modernization, we got the FA50s, etc. So this is the worst record. The Duterte administration has the worst record when it comes to dealing with China of any Filipino administration. And for them to lecture, Marcos Jr., who met Mao Zedong when he's, he was probably younger than you and I, right? Uh, this is a guy who lived global diplomacy at the highest level. He was part of the mission together with his mom when they went to China to normalize these ties. So if folks can refer to my interviews, two interviews I had with Ambassador Romaldes about this because he's a family friend, of course. He's a close family of the Marcos. So he knows about this. He was in Beijing when we normalized our ties with Maoist China in the 1970s. The fundamental problem with the Dutertismo logic on China is they do not understand geopolitics. In geopolitics, if you're weak or seen as weak or you're shooting yourself in the foot, you will be treated with contempt. And that's why he got nothing from China. Everyone, all of these pro-Duterte people are now citing Vietnam. I just wrote a piece about Vietnam. Uh, 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 you know, who see Vietnam, you know, because they're nice to China. They're getting BYD investment, blah, 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 blah. But my point is, there are many reasons why Vietnam is getting investments from China, including their geography. They're just next to Prairie. But the other thing is, Vietnam first established its red lines, fought for those red lines, got China's respect, and then dealt with them from a position of strength exactly. after so strengthening relationship. Have, um, exactly. Exactly. So my point, Justin, here is this is really, I think, where our episode should culminate is sh my, my, my advice to people na nagmamagaling dyan is ganito, for six years, ang, ang baba ng tingin ng 
China sa atin dahil sa ginagawa ni Digong. Dahil ang sabog ng alliance natin with US because of Digong. Dahil yung US din, hindi ganun ka-reliable until 2019 when Pompeo said they will stand by us under these conditions and uh, clarify the mutual defense treaty uh, provisions in a public way in a specific South China Sea. But, but, but yun nga, yun ang point ko eh. So that means we need a year or two to remind China that Philippines... Whoever is the president, you're not going to get another digong, right? And, and this is not about Marcos Jr. This is not about Marcos funds and supposed... Because, eto, Justina, this is the conspiracy theory that comes out from, from my friends in China and Hong Kong. They keep on saying, oh, Marcos cut a deal with the Americans, didn't he? Kaya siguro pro-American siya. See how dismissive they are? And I said, oh, now you care about the Marcos corruption. Where were you last year? Where were you when Duterte's good governance was being quite... Oh, now suddenly you guys are for good governance. Fantastic. Very, yeah, very... I think, <laughs> ano, unsustainable talaga yung policy ng China with respect sa South China Sea ngayon. Kasi, parang kumbaga, hindi niya ma-imagine na any country will stand up to China in defense of its national sovereignty. Parang sa kanila, kapag nag-stand up ka, It must be something you have been bought or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Pero, di ba, realistically... Because that's how they do it themselves, right? How, yeah, how, why do you think Hun Sen of Cambodia is good to them? Do you think yeah. it's out of love and ideological alignment? No. Because Hun Sen gets like, what, one-third of his budget from aid in Japan, China and whatever. Yeah, I mean... Yung difference lang kasi with the Duterte admin, if, if we really sum it up, no, talagang, it had a very distorted view of independent foreign policy. No? Hindi nga siya hedging, eh. it, it was really tilting toward China. Ngayon, for example, we have some political camps in the Philippines say, bakit hindi tayo katulad ng Vietnam or India, for example, which is a bit more neutral toward China, a bit more distant toward the United States, medyo mas balanced. But if you look at those countries, diba, kunyari yung India, yung border disputes nila with China, actually, it led to some casualties. They really stood for yung, yung demarcation line nila uh, in their northern border with, uh, with China. Um, and that led to some like, that led to some disputes, but it didn't, you know, in, it, it didn't lead to the explosion of China India ties. So, the interpretation of independent foreign policy doesn't mean unarmed neutrality, right? For them, independent foreign policy means that you're not being too close to any particular camp, but at the same time, you still stick up. Dun sa mga national security non-negotiables mo. But for the Philippine case, really, pag inisip mo talaga siya, itong resupply ng BRP Sierra Madre, itong pagpatrol natin of our EEZ, for example, these are operational non-negotiables for the Philippines. Kahit sinong presidente, they have to faithfully execute that function. No? So, kaya this is really where all the problem um, is coming to surface right now. Talagang the China policy toward the Philippines is wrong. Laging si tinasabi that the Philippine policy toward China is wrong. But you also examine the other side. Yeah. Tama ba yung policy ng China toward the Philippines? It it has the all the wrong assumptions from any reasonable Philippine administration. It, it's taking the extreme as the model for how it can conduct good relations. So how can it conduct good relations like that? So that's still up for debate. We'll see how things pan mm. out. But for now... I don't think things are looking good for China. Public opinion in the Philippines is not with them. Well, some oligarchs are are raising concerns with you know. But eh, no, I mean you to end and on and on this on this episode, we might need sponsors down the road. <laughs> I mean, for me, what is our advice here? Because the way it looks to me is okay. This is a little bit risky. This is a little bit scary. But this is the value of tears that we have to go through to gain respect we have to make it clear to china that we're not going to be intimidated that we're not just an american lackey and we can do this on our own and that whoever is the filipino president it's not going to be another duterte that was sui generis in the worst sense of the word it's not going to happen again it's time for you to adjust and accept situation on the ground and stop gaslighting the philippines because all we are doing is exercising our sovereign rights within our own exclusive economic zone. It is not the Philippines that is claiming 85% of the South China Sea Basin. The Philippines is just claiming what is within its own exclusive economic zone, right? I mean, that's all we're doing. For you, how do you see this? Should we just stick to the status quo? And what are the additions? What are the pluses we should bring in beyond this proactive transparency initiative and non-compromising rural missions? 
Ako, ako, I'll be very honest though. I, I don't think we need to redraw all our plans. We just need to faithfully and continually uh, execute them. Yeah. Yung, yung, kasi yung, at the end of the day, no, that's how deterrence is built. It's making sure that we credibly tell the other side that we are going to continue with these resupply missions despite your opposition. We are determined to do this. We will respond to you if you stop them. That's how you establish, that's how you right. utilize itong mga resupply missions down the line. No? I don't think we need to really do anything new, to be honest. Na ito, for example, you don't even need to, for example, invite American battleships in that in that right. area, etc. Although that's well within prerogative ng Philippines, no. If the situation calls for it, that's that's uh, that's our that's our sovereign right to bring in our allies. But at the end of the day, you don't need to immediately go to that escalation point. We just need to continue what we're doing. The problem talaga dito is how China is responding to routine Philippine activity. So. Um, that's that for me is the flashpoint um, regarding this conflict. In terms of the political sphere, ito, dito ako medyo, I think the Marcos administration should work on. I think it should try to at least try to improve relations with China. Kasi ang nangyayari ngayon, um, so there are some inflammatory statements from the Philippine government, for example, na um, the, the next flashpoint is not Taiwan, it's the South China Sea, um, etc. So, Kumbaga, it draws unnecessary attention to the Philippines without the without the concomitant actions on the ground. So yes, we're hyping up support na, oh, this is an important mm-hmm. issue that the international community should care about. Pero essentially, on the ground ba, what are we doing? I, re- I was looking at the statement yesterday, uh, today, ng Westcom, ng AFP. Sabi ng AFP, yung swarming of Chinese ships in the Second Thomas Shoal ngayon, malapit sa BRP Sierra Madre. Sabi nila, it's not an invasion. You know? I mean, I would leave it to them what kind of you know mental gymnastics or justification they want to say it. I respect that kung ganun ang stratcom ng government natin. But for me, that's actually an indication na the Philippine government is trying to calm down uh, the tensions as much as it can without compromising yung, yung operational security ng Pilipinas. So, um, that's, re- that's really the bottom line. We need to just continue um, continue doing all these things maybe fine-tune some of the relations with China and right. then try to figure out itong assertive transparency policy na ito. No? Um, we could try to have a bit of a more muscular military presence on the ground. No? Example, yung sa ayungin, uh, yung sa atin ito, atin ito mm. Christmas convoy. No? I think I told si Commodore Tariela this in public na if you look at that incident, originally, sabi ng Philippine government, don't don't do this convoy, it's risky at this point in right. time. But then, because of the mounting public support for Atin Ito, eventually, no, they conceded, they supported it. Ngayon, by the time na sinuportahan nila yung convoy, sila na ngayon yung nagpupush dun sa captain ng ship to, yes, continue mo, tuloy right. yung destination nyo, even if there is Chinese harassment. Had they done that from the very beginning, we would have avoided that very public humiliation that China preventing a ship a convoy ironically named atin ito which is right. this is this is ours it's a very politically significant event so we will take some time to recover from that very public humiliation so ngayon ang ang nakikita ko in the future what the philippine government could do once it decides to support convoys like that it has to go all in it has to ensure that those trips continue and they end successfully because the moment they say that we will allow this convoy, it's no longer a private activity. No? Right. Kahit pa i-deny ng NTFWP is that it's a civilian mission. It becomes a public event and therefore deserving of the full support of our security sector. Kasi trabaho nila yan eh. Mm. Di ba? And we should avoid political um, political humiliations to the country kung gagawin din pala natin yung mga convoys na yung tulig so I think we, we should just stay the course. Huh? Right, Maybe exactly. Just, we have to just go through this yeah. quite rough patch, but this is part of the growing up. This is the uh, rate of passage for the Philippines yeah. strategically. I think this Kasi is... Yung, yeah. yung danger naman dyan is we are goaded into escalating our actions. We don't have yeah. to escalate. We just have to continue what we've been doing. No? And we don't have to de-escalate in the sense that titigil mo yung mga yeah. convoy, titigil mo yung resupply missions just because... Um, there is this pushback from China right now. That's it's why there's diplomacy, escalation. right? I think exactly. what we're looking at here is calibrated escalation. Uh, or at least, 
calibrated assertiveness, if you can put it yes, that way, and then operationally uh, uh, define that. On that note, thank you very much, uh, Justin, for, for another fantastic discussion. I think this was very timely. Um, there's you know, a lot of posturing and sloganeering out there, but we have to really be serious about what's happening here and what should be the next step. Thank you very much for this. In next episode, let's discuss ASEAN. Let's discuss what should be done with China disinformation, with, with the whole Duterte Unitim uh, implosion. Because whether we want it or not, the future of West Philippines will also depend on the future of our politics and how we deal with uh, sharp power, disinformation, and threats to our democracy. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next one right off the bat. Thanks, Justin, for that. You good? You want to take a water or something? Yeah, sure. No problem. Good. Good. All right, everyone, welcome back to Pod Para sa Pilipinas. I'm joined by uh, one of our co-conspirators, Justin Bakizal. Uh, you know, we hope to be joined by the rest of the gang uh, in, in the coming days and weeks as we wrap up the year and discuss the biggest issues concerning Philippine foreign policy, West Philippine Sea, among others. But in the previous episode, we discussed the second Thomas Scholl, Ayungin Scholl situation, and we, we tried to expose myths or disinformation about, you know, essentially the whole gaslighting industry, cottage industry. Oh, Philippines, we should not provoke China. It's our fault that we're asserting our own sovereign rights. You know, all of, all of the kind of, alam na natin yan, Nonsense uh, rhetoric out there by our good friends on the other side. Okay, now, the, nevertheless, okay, <laughs> the two um, silences, the deafening silences over the past week are... In no particular order, one is from Vice President of the Republic, Sara Duterte, who has been saying everything on everything. I mean, my stance on Gaza, my stance on peace process, my stance practically on anything under the sun. Uh, of course, Depet Secretary, she has hanash about many things. But, you know, just com- silence, right? Tuloy, nagkaroon ng memes, di ba? Na nilagay nila yung yung greeting niya sa China during uh, founding of Chinese Communist Party. So, also memes are coming out. So, this is not a vice president that lacks opinion. But for some reason, when com- whenever something big happens, meaning China bullying in the Philippines, they go completely quiet. But the other is silence, which is really frustrating to me. <laughs> Justin, I, I just came back again for sing- from our good friends in Singapore. I was there for the China Stockholm Forum. We had another discussion there. And, you know, again, maybe I, I ruffled a lot, a lot of feathers among our ASEAN friends. And I said, you know, when it comes to ASEAN, 10 South China Sea, they're just north of useless, right? Like, <laughs> I really asked. But, and everyone laughed except the guys from ASEAN there. Like, I said, they're just north of useless. Because, my goodness, they're saying nothing. I mean, what are they waiting for? The only thing I heard is from Prime Minister Lee of Singapore saying a few weeks ago about, Oi, Philippines, ingat lang kayo, ingat lang kayo dyan. Parang, mm-hmm. Wow, thanks. Like, okay. And and not twist pa nga yun sa Pilipinas. Diba? And yun nga, na-weaponize yun. Again, as I said, to, I, and I'm, I'm being genuine here, I told to my Singaporean friends, I know the Prime Minister meant well. I, I don't think... And that question came out of nowhere because it was a it was a new economy Bloomberg Forum. Let's not forget, yeah. this was about global economy, great power competition. So I think he just wanted to give a friendly, con- constructive advice. The problem is it was twisted and it was weaponized by mga malus I'm sorry my mga marites of this world na biglang West Philippine Sea expert biglang may maraming masabi given their body of scholarship and expertise so eto na so let's first talk about ASEAN before we go to the Duterte's our favorite topic i mean what is your take on this Justin because one of the things that annoys me is they always say, well, Philippines is really Western and all, so this is how they deal with it. We in ASEAN were quiet and all. And I didn't know strategic coward this is a is a is a non-Western Oriental. I, I'm, I'm not sure about that because Vietnam will will have a say on that. You know, India will have a say on that. They're not quiet. They call out China when they, then funny things happen. So how, how do you see that, uh, 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 Justin? Them uh, occidentalizing the Philippines uh, or trying to say, oh, mga Filipinos, hindi talaga naman mga Asians yan, mga Latin yan, Americanized yan. How do you feel about it? Because, you know, you, you also deal with our ASEAN counterparts and friends. Yeah. Ako, mixed yung feelings ko about this. No? On the one hand, you, you can really feel yung pagiging unfair ng ASEAN. Na, for example, ASEAN will say, 
non-interference is a very key principle of ASEAN. And, and yet, a lot of the politicians in ASEAN, well, they are very tactless about commenting that the Philippines is provoking China, right? Or at least alluding to that. Yeah, exactly. So, non-interference, pero pagdating sa Philippine defense and foreign policy, wala silang pakialam if they are commenting on our uh, yeah. defense and security posture. So I think there's a certain double standard there, no? Na tayo nga, yung Philippines, we don't, at least at the government level, we don't call out our exactly. Asian neighbors for saying na you 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 lack the the right. fortitude to stand up to China. We don't say that in public. Right. Pero sila, you, you, some, you hear it from some of the some Indonesian elections na yun. This is another topic na parang ang naging dating is don't provoke China too much. Ang hindi nila naiintindihan, same, same with, as you mentioned, yung sa case ng Singapore, kapag naririnig yun domest, ng domestic audience dito sa Pilipinas, they are taking that as signaling from our neighbors that they, that they are criticizing Philippine foreign policy. So that's the reality of it. Even if they don't mean it like that. So that's the problem. Na, merong asymmetry. But on the other hand, ito, dito tayo medyo nag, hindi, hindi align ng opinion. Kasi ado, ako, ah, I actually think na I take it as a given that ASEAN is useless. Hindi na lang north of useless. Ah. I will really say it. ASEAN is really useless when it comes to um, dealing with all these disputes with China. Indonesia as the chair of ASEAN has already stated that ASEAN is not the forum for territorial disputes and so forth. Fine. Right. Um, but what that also means uh, is that Yung, yung, yung lack of utility ng ASEAN to the Philippines, that's precisely the point why we are turning to Australia, the United States, United Kingdom, and now France. No? And, 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 wait, 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 and, and India. I mean, I said something like, uh, India has done more for the Philippines in the past year than ASEAN in the past yeah. decade in the West Philippines, because of course. In, because India supported yung arbitrage. Yeah, they, they call it West Philippine Sea. They called out China earlier this month, uh, uh, earlier this year, sorry. Uh, about the bullying situation there and they're gonna give us Brahmos supersonic monster system. Yeah. Name me one ASEAN country which has come anywhere exactly. close to giving us any of those three, right? In recent memory. Exactly. So, dami tagang tulong na India. Pero ito kasi, yung ASEAN is a bit of a different beast because a lot of the ASEAN states, they're also arms importing countries, right? So, for example, Indonesia also buys equipment from India, from Russia, and so forth. No? Same thing, uh, Philippines, Viet Vietnam as well. Vietnam used to be very dependent on Russia for its uh, weaponry. So, in that respect, many Southeast Asian states are just playing catch up when it comes to naval modernization, force projection, etc. Kaya hindi rin nila tayo matulungan, which I understand. Um, so, in that respect, ako personally, I take it as a given na wala naman talagang mahigita ang Pilipinas with respect to ASEAN. So, Ako, personally, I don't want to. I I would if I want to advise the president. Bog na nating i waste yung political capital natin trying to agitate our neighbors. So that's where we disagree. Because for me, I think that it's yeah. worth engaging them. Uh, don't expect ten. Expect four, and I'm okay with four. What is four? Uh, you know, at least make a statement about we expect you know in a shared community of nations we refrain from certain aggressive actions you don't even have to name china just a statement by the foreign ministry of malaysia a statement by farmers of singapore indonesia it's a four it's not a ten i don't know no, no, I, I mean bilaterally now no asian 10 uh, use kaya nga sabi ko it's just north of useless asian 10 on the south china on the south china sea not on everything just to be clear i like asian on many issues so parang ASEAN minus. This is so, ASEAN so, minilateral, ASEAN bilateral, exactly. So I think it would be nice if uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, these countries, if they're foreign ministries, just release a statement. Not you know, like, side. of course they're not in a position to sign up to China militarily. Just that. Just like what India did, which is a statement on wag niyo buli ng Pilipinas. Yun lang naman ang ano, uh, uh, hiningi ko eh. Kaya nga, uh, uh, Justin, the irony is that in ASEAN, literally the headquarters of ASEAN, Heydarian is known as the ASEAN basher, right? He's the guy who goes to the Western countries and think tanks, says things funny about ASEAN, everyone loves that ASEAN, right? And I'm, I'm sure they're gonna say also, it's not like Heydarian is a very Southeast Asian name. I'm sure they're gonna even make some slurs about me like that. Um, uh, now, I'm just being, but the thing is, I'm brutally honest because this is my Carino Brutal. I love yeah. ASEAN. I've lived in different regions of the world. They have Game of Thrones in the Middle East. We don't want to have that, right? Um, 
But nasa sayangan ako kasi napaka mediocre na as yan nowadays. Precise because of the type of leadership, not because of the organization itself. Because you know, I mean, during the Cold War period, ASEAN was gangster, right? It would yeah. side with Pol Pot against Vietnam, horrible thing. Yeah. But later on, it bullied Hun Sen to form a democratic government before joining ASEAN. Which is, which by the way, no, para siguro din sa mga listeners, which is actually a good point. Kasi merong attempt ngayon to characterize na ASEAN fundamentally is just a talking shop. But if you look at it historically, no, for example, yung pag-support nila, yung pag-support nila kay Pol Pot against Vietnam, for example, That is a clear case of hard military balancing. Yeah. So it's not as if ASEAN as an institution or at least the individual member states are so into this hedging strategy that they will never commit yeah. to hard military balancing. They have committed to it before. And I think, yun yung nga point eh, medyo nawala yung ganung kind of thinking within ASEAN. No? Parang medyo kinain siya within its, with its own Um, talking points, everybody's sort of doing diplomacy. It's a beauty queen, pa- it's a beauty pageant. I'm sorry to say, again, I'm going to be in trouble. They made it into a miscongeniality contest, right? And this is yeah. this is the problem because the more ASEAN does not, <laughs> it's just like what I said about BBM. When you're conflict avoidant, you, you, you invite conflict. The more ASEAN doesn't draw the line, the more it's inviting the superpowers to impose their will, the more you're risking another new Cold War and the more you're gonna undermine regional security. So I'll, I'll make exactly the same. Kaya nga for me, Carino Brutal, I want to call it out because I know ASEAN can do better. But that's, that's the thing, Justin, your opinion about ASEAN, whether it's worth it, guess what? I'm hearing it from a lot of leading strategic thinkers in the Philippines. Ironically, I'm actually the most ASEAN lover, I would say, right. among Filipino strategic thinkers, you know? And, and I'm not saying as a, as a point of pride, I'm just saying it factually. Because very few uh, Filipino experts even bother to be emotional and passionate about ASEAN and and look at its history, Pol Pot, and and you know, I'm the only one who does it because the rest are saying it's not even worth it. I rather invest in South Korea, so India, what, France. So yeah. Just to explain that context, which is prevalent even within our own government, by the way, no? just in case. Of course, I mean they're part of the strategic part. elite. We're all part of the um, same circles. Yeah. This is a very prevalent view in government for us for the simple reason that. It sort of pisses us off that you know, yung yung ASEAN right now, increasingly over the last 10 years, no, hindi na ay, matatanggap mo pa eh, if ASEAN just stays quiet and is useless. But right now, there's an attempt to shift as it's uh, and ASEAN is not useless from the perspective of China, because China has used ASEAN and some of the member states, for example, to delay yung code of conduct discussions to water down. Some of the communities. So ASEAN is an enabler. Yeah. So hindi na nga lang siya useless. It, to some extent, it's becoming an impediment to effective Philippine foreign policy. Ngayon, I myself included, I don't want to pick this fight. Yung talagang, you know, it's not be confrontational with ASEAN and say, you need to stop doing this, etc. Ang akin na lang, okay, fine, I'm going to sidestep you. I'm just going to be diplomatic. We're going to sidestep you insofar as def- our defense policy is concerned. Provided na kayo, ASEAN, Um, should not be commenting on Philippine domestic and fo- uh, foreign policy uh, decisions. At least for me, you know, don't that was discussion. Room. It's a very practical um, approach to the ASEAN. I do understand uh, also the criticism to that. I'm just explaining why it's a prevailing mindset. Yes, I mean, Philippine remember I, I said something about optics before. Remember you tweeted something about back in the day how annoying this China, you know, Why is the U.S. like begging China for for meal to meal comms and all of that? And you know, and they're playing. I said, you know, this is about optics. This is about U.S. projecting itself as the responsible actor. And I think there's a value in that optics because geopolitics is about optics too, right? So for me, it's also optics because you know I'm very active online, so I I'm, I follow a lot of pro-China people. They say some. I mean, pro-China not on just West Philippines, like pro-China in general because they hate America. So your typical lefty, Frenchy people, right? Uh, sound stuff on some issues, but horrible stuff on Ukraine and Philippines. In fact, I saw them essentially Ukrainizing Philippines, presenting the Philippines as the, you know, the edge of the knife of NATO pointing at China, completely disrespecting our strategic agency, completely disregarding our sovereign rights. So for me, you don't want to give these idiots more ammunition optics wise right because if it's because again if, if it's just france germany uk us australia japan saying supporting thing about it's so easy for these uh idiots right to to twist it 
my point is that's why it matters that a country like India says Andrew. something. A country but like think, Indonesia. Do you get what I'm saying? For me, because optics matter. Right? Okay, that four is important it, for me. Four out of ten. Ini yeah. ini isip ko siya how it works in practice, no? Because ako, okay, fine. If we wanna push this ASEAN route, I actually think I would bet na ASEAN would more easily consent to maritime patrol, ASEAN-led maritime patrols in the South China Sea, than to issue a statement explicitly condemning China, for example. But isn't that so, what Indonesia tried earlier this year in just in North Natuna Sea, Cambodia vetoed it, and the Philippines just, uh, I didn't join at all the South Natuna Sea version. It's then, not like this is new the, idea. Then, uh, maybe, then maybe the approach should be an ASEAN minus approach. You know? So. It, we don't really need ASEAN, the entire institution, but we just need to... Important, ito, I think I mentioned this in one of the previous episodes, important for us to have a very balanced um, defense partnership portfolio. So it would be very good if we can have Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, um, Singapore on board. The other, the other ASEAN states... Honestly, it's not a must-have for me. Yeah, I agree with so you on that. Yeah, that's my point, but, exactly. But yeah, yeah we're agreeing. We can, make, we can try to make headway with countries that may be more predisposed uh, to support us. So I think that's a practical way to, to address yung ganong line of thinking. So actually, we're in agreement, right? Uh, because, you know, we have to always distinguish ASEAN as an organization and ASEAN countries, which, which are two different things. I always say the parts are bigger than the whole. Like, again, ASEAN 10, practically useless on South China Sea. But Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, Philippines, that could be very, very important, yes. right? And actually, from what I know, President Marcus Jr. is going to have a state visit to one of these key countries in ASEAN soon. So we yeah, can yeah. discuss that soon. All right. That will be a different topic. Now, let's go to the other omission here. Big omission here. Um, uh, yeah, I mean... You have VP Sara barely saying anything, and then now you have some of these oligarchs openly coming out and saying, "Oh, not any machading on in China." I mean, first of all, like, what are we losing again from China? Because China keeps on trading with us anyway, whether it's Aquino, Duterte, yeah, and all. Exactly. If it's all about high quality investments, where's the high quality investment? There was not there anyway. When we, so, I, I just don't see what's the argument here. Uh, and and for me. If, if this Philippines becoming a reliable ally of the West is bringing high quality semiconductor investments from US, from Taiwan, whatever, then I'll take it any day. And then later on, maybe we can talk to China once they've made up their mind. Because clearly they have not made up their mind because they want the Philippines to be just a giant Cambodia, like Hun Sen's Cambodia. And it's not. I'm sorry. It's not. So you have to wake up to the reality. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, what's your take on that angle? Um, I think when it comes to etong China, I call it the China blackmail argument na, na they have a big economic leverage over the Philippines. Therefore, we should moderate our own uh, our own foreign policy. And ako, I always remind people, if you look at what's happening right now, that is an imagined problem. It is not an actualized problem. Ang dami nagsasabi that, you know, China will retaliate against the Philippines economically. But... Actually, no, pag dinignan mo yung datos, and someone actually wrote this, I think si Colin Ko from Singapore wrote this. If you look at the trade data na released ng Philippine Statistics Authority, yung trade natin with China has actually remained constant throughout this 2023, even if meron tayong tensions with uh, with them in the, the maritime, in the, in the, in maritime zone. So, the idea that, you know, China will just economically retaliate um, every time we have tensions, it's actually an argument made by Filipinos more than the Chinese. And right. you know, nakakahiya yun. It, it means that Filipinos are doing China's work for them. Basically, being propagandists. They're, they're the useful idiots, yeah. Yeah. Essentially, China doesn't even say it in public that it will economically coerce the Philippines. So, sino ang nagsasabi nun? Yung mga propagandists ng China dito sa Pilipinas, they make that argument regardless of the evidence for it. Now, there has been a, this Bloomberg article about you know Filipino uh, business community expressing fears mm. that they may be affected um, by the tension market jitters. Okay, I understand with that sentiment, but as it stands, where is the actual economic harm being done to them? The article didn't even cite exact um, mechanisms by which they are being coerced or harmed by these by these tensions. Right. So at, as it stands. Concerned sila about Philippine-China tensions, yes, everybody is concerned about it. But if you're talking about the economic repercussions, you show me the numbers that there's an actual economic right. repercussion to this before you go on public scaring people away that 
you know, the, the, we are one breath away from econ full economic sabotage by, by China, right? So show me the evidence for that. Now, on the part ng omission, ito important, yung omission ni Vice President Sara um, in responding to the West Philippines, I do think it's a very big mistake on her part. Kasi yung omission, kunyari, ah, yung, 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 you put the omission niya na hindi siya nagsasalita on the West Philippines Sea, you put that omission in context, no? Nagsasalita siya about itong sa NTFL ka, nagsasalita siya about itong kay Lorraine Badoy, SMNI issue. So she does have the time, she, do, she is willing to spend the political capital to publicly disagree with um, the Marcos administration. Right. But she doesn't have, she doesn't want to spend the political capital to call out China for its behavior. And for me, um, let's assume, no, for the sake of argument, that she's going to be president in 2028. Yung ginagawa niya ngayon sets her administration in the future on a bad footing because China's, ang mini-message niya sa China is, China, I have your back. Truth, parang through thick or thin, regardless of what you're doing on the ground, I'm not gonna lift... Or you're your inviting head. China to interfere yeah. in the upcoming elections because yeah. they know they may have a reliable friend. So, if you look at it, no, talagang it's not it's not a good it's not a good it doesn't right. have a good impact on the Philippines as a country. No, I'm, I'm gonna throw aside the politics, whatever, no, whether or not you agree with her. But, but what we can what we can all say is that she should um, she should be speaking about this issue if she, if at the end of the day, meron naman pala siyang effort to make statements on various issues. Ideally, and some people have pointed this out. Why do we want Sarah Duterte to talk about foreign policy when the chief architect of foreign policy is the president and she should respect it? Right. Pero yun na nga, yung context nga kasi nakakapagsalita siya on other defense issues. No? She spoke about the Afghan refugee right. issue with the Americans. She spoke about NTFL. So she can talk about security issues. She's just not talking about China disputes. No? So that is where the asymmetry lies. Now, if she's quiet on everything, no, talagang she has this dignified silence. She's allowing the presidency to conduct its policy um, without worrying that you know she might have a, a different opinion. Then that's gonna be fine with me as well, no? Right. G- giving the incumbent due respect on to conduct defense affairs, which is fine. Which you, you know, when you come to think about it, during the Duterte administration, to be fair to Lenny Robredo, Lenny Robredo didn't actually criticize Duterte so much on itong foreign policy niya with China. The Liberal Party as a whole, yes, you know, we have seen Senator Rizzo on Tiveros as well, but Robredo as Vice President actually allowed Duterte to conduct um, hit that foreign policy, I'll be very frank, that foreign policy coup no, na, na, na bago yung relations with China. Even if, you know, objectively talagang it was bad for Philippine national interest. She kept her dignified silence for that. So I do think also that the vice president should at least um, accord the incumbent administration that that courtesy as well. That's 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 a very important one. Actually, I was just looking at the graphs here of uh, trade between Philippines and China. Very consistently, it has increased uh, throughout the days. I mean, yeah. I probably can even share it here for people to see. Yeah. I was just about to post it on Twitter. Alam mo naman, and I think yung economic sabotage argument na yan, I think some people omit the broader context ng Philippine economic relations. Ang number one foreign direct investor of ASEAN as a region is the United States. So kung ang argument mo is that you should not pick fights with countries that have economic leverage over our country and our neighbors here, then why aren't they willing to make that argument to make peace with the U.S.? No, right. In fact, they're doing the entire opposite. Not only are they willing to ignore the economic importance of the United States, they are very much willing to agitate against the United States. So, diba? that really shows what their true colors are. Yun nga, I mean, this is not just about trade, right? China keeps on exporting. to. This is about quality investments. This is about job creation in the Philippines. On that front, it's U.S. and Japan way ahead of China. Exactly. China is, irre- is almost irrelevant compared to these countries when it comes to the level of high quality jobs. How many high quality jobs is Huawei and I don't know Chinese companies are creating in the Philippines compared to oh my God, how many Japanese American companies? Exactly. I come from Baguio, right? So Texas Instruments has been c- providing good quality jobs 
for my friends and their families for quite a long time. Oh, you tell me how many Chinese companies have been doing that, right? And please don't talk about Pogo, right? <laughs> or you want to get any investment? Oh, please, right? Let's not get there. But you, you, you can make an absolutely good point. If you really care about economics and all, bakit kayo hindi concerned dun sa impact ng US or Japan? But maybe, Justin, they're implying or they're admitting that that's the difference. America is a democracy. We attack them, they're tolerant. But China, because they're a dictatorship, if you're bad to them, they'll punish you. Maybe, Justin, that's what they're admitting, right? <laughs> exactly. So what does that tell you about the, the two different partners, right? That tells you something right. about the character and the nature of the political system right, of those right. states. No? Right, so right. which do you want to partner with? Now, I don't want to force the... It's not my place to force people to choose a side. But let's not have Ill delusions here about the nature of, uh, of, of these countries that we're trying to deal with. So at least as much as possible to try to deal with, approach things more impartially as much as we can and try to view it more objectively. Hindi yung meron tayong mga strategic commission whatsoever na to that is, frankly, China doesn't deserve that kind of um, prudence from some Filipinos that they will undermine our own national security just for the sake of having good relations with China. It's an important factor, yes. So, just say, don't don't kill me. Sorry about that. I think I've, I may have pressed something. Now, wala bigla yung recording ng part. Ah, yeah. I, I, yun nga, okay. Sorry about. That. I don't know what happened. Maybe are we being savage? Because I know I pressed, but I think it's just the second part. No, yung the part we're talking. Uli na lahat very mabilis lang siguro. Oh, sorry, sorry. What, sorry what my my apologies about. I have the audio here anyway. We have the audio, okay. but 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 so, you know, just to for the video purposes, don't worry sure, about sure. it. Again, I'm my yung audio, yung questions what I forgot already. No, I'll get back to it. Don't worry, I'll reframe where, it. Where did it cut? Okay, okay. Sure, sure. okay for some reason, na cut yung sinasabi natin yan. No, uh, the context essentially was this. This argument that uh, if you are tougher in asserting our own rights, uh, we may risk ma massive economic relations with China. And what we have been saying is that there's no evidence to back that up. Because if you look at trade exactly. linkages between the Philippines and China, actually, it has consistently increased over the, you know, over the decades, uh, uh, over the past decade exactly. or so. You can clearly see here, right, the trade from 2010 to 2019, through Aquino all the way to, to uh, pre-pandemic era, it increased consistently. So data after data shows that it, it looks like, uh, you know, when it comes to bilateral trade relations, which, by the way, increasingly benefits China more than us. They're far more exporting to us than us exporting them. Yeah. So they're earning yeah. way more than, uh, than from us than we from the... It looks like it's almost agnostic. It's geopolitically agnostic. Yes. Uh, it is not sensitive to uh, to any kind of, you know, um, the geopolitical shock. So this whole myth that if you're nice to China, you'll get huge investments. Like, and Which is the next question. Okay, trade, it looks like it's it's not... There's no strong correlation whatsoever with geopolitics. Investment, maybe, there's some correlation. Yeah. But Duterte was super nice to them and yet got no high-quality big-ticket infrastructure investments. Where is the Bandung-Jakarta railway project? Where is the Mindanao railway project? You know, like our version of Bandung-Jakarta. Where is the Mindanao railway? Where is the Clark railway project? None of them came in. And please don't talk about some small bridge uh, that, uh, you know, enrich a few Chinese contractors in there is somewhere in, I don't know, Pasig, Pasay, whatever. That, that's not a big ticket infrastructure project. Please increase, medyo taas nyo naman yung standards, you know. So, so my point, and, and, and your point is, the hypocrisy of this argument is that when the, it comes to the United States, U.S. is actually a big source exactly. of trade and investment and jobs, mm -hmm. and yet they're not worried when Duterte attacked them and said, let's end our alliance with yeah. them. Can you, can you expound on that? Okay, I, I'll go back to your point. Because the biggest investor in ASEAN, the FDIs, is the United States, right? It's not right. China. So if we are concerned, yung, yung argument that we should be nice to countries that have economic leverage over us, why right. doesn't that apply toward the United States? No? The United States is a source of many high-paying, high-quality jobs here in the Philippines. No? A lot of yung, mga multinational companies ng BPO industry, which is one of the biggest sectors in the Philippine economy, these are American companies. And yet, we weren't worried when, during the Duterte administration, Duterte was flat out making very ridiculous, you know, um, statements like, it's the Philippines, Russia, and China against the world. We are right. turning away from the United States. Kung, kung ikaw talaga, you love the Philippines, and you want us to have good relations with all of our important economic partners, then why is it that they are not calling for that kind of restraint? 
when it comes to the US or to Japan. Parang hindi eh. And in fact, it is even the opposite. Not only don't, don't they care about it, they will actively agitate against right. the United States. Right, Talaga, right. Diba, that, that is really what a lot of the Duterte support, frankly, the Duterte supporters right now are doing. Talaga, very anti-US. But my point is, what benefit does it give the Philippines when you do that? Diba? So, and, and that's where my point comes in. Maybe, maybe they're indirectly saying that, well, U.S. is a democracy. I mean, of course, we can have a debate about horrible interventions. I'm saying, because U.S. is a democracy, they're willing to tolerate pushback by, by the Philippines. <laughs> but the other one is a dictatorship. So like a gangster, you don't follow them, there's going to be consequences, my friend. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? So they're actually, they're actually contributing to otherization of China. I mean, Duterte also kept on doing that. Oh, if we assert our West Philippine Sea, they will go to war to us. And you know what, China is like, no, we're not like that. We're not exactly. just going to invade you for disagreement. We have disagreement with Vietnam. We have border because, disputes. I mean, That's, yeah, realistic. they're giving a bad name to China, these propagandist people, yeah. If we're being realistic about it, you showed the graph that parang ag agnostic na to exactly, yeah. situation, yung, yung economic footprint ng China with the Philippines, yung bilateral trade natin. I think, restituhin naman natin yung Philippines na, the reason why Chinese businesses do business here in the Philippines is because there's money to be made. Exactly. Right? There is an economic logic to that. And that economic logic is independent ng policy ng administration. It's not as if China is only investing in the Philippines because the Duterte family has yeah. good relations with them. That is really, that's a preposterous, that's a preposterous argument. That they're only investing here if they have good relations with with the current president. Ganun ka importante ang president ng Pilipinas that the market will move with the president. I don't think so. That's well, that's understand. what Marcos says, right? I need to travel around the world, sell the country, and then boom, pa yung FDI after all his Magellan Jr. trips. <laughs> that's another. That's another topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's my point. Eh. Yun ang uni team nila. Na both of them have this myth of the great yeah. leader going there and moving global markets. Well, guess what? It's a scam. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. You think, you know, I, I, I advise Wall Street, hedge funds, whatever, right? They're not idiots. They have their own research team. They talk to people yeah. like me who know what's happening. You think they're going to listen to a speech by BBM and Digong and make this? You think Chinese businessmen are just going to listen to some incoherent speech by Digong and decide they're going to go? It doesn't work that way. It's far more complicated. Let's give, let's, let's respect the businessmen. They're not idiots. Exactly. They're smart people. Now, last point. Sorry if ever lang nawala. You were saying... On the part of Sara Duterte, there's, her silence was something dangerous, right? Because it may create some perverse uh, expectations by China. And I said it may even risk encouraging China to interfere in the domestic affairs because they may think, I'm not saying that's the case, but they may think that they may have their, their person here in the Philippines ahead of 2028 elections. Yeah. They may get some ideas that there's a Manchurian candidate here in, here in the Philippines, which is a very valid problem. Now, Going back to yung nasabi ko before we got cut off, no? that whatever Sara Duterte is doing right now, it sets the tone. If eventually she becomes president, no, which is her goal anyway, it sets the tone for what kind of president she's going to be. right? On the one hand, you have her talking all about, very vocally on itong NTFL cap, and talking about the Afghan refugee issue being um, requested na i-accept ng Philippines by the United States. So she has proven that she can actually talk about defense affairs and she can expend political capital yeah. to make her thoughts known about the topic. And that's why her, the absence of her, any of her positions on the South China Sea issue is, is damaging to the Philippines, frankly. Ngayon, there are two approaches to this. I would respect her if he, she just kept a dignified silence on this issue. No? Now, she doesn't talk about any security issue out of deference to the president, um, which is which was, if you look at it, not to be fair, during the last administration, see Vice President Lenny Robredo had the same approach when it comes to Duterte's foreign policy. Right. Even if talagang we, there were at times talagang statements like the Philippines will break ties with the United States, we moved to terminate the visiting forces agreement, although hindi yun nangyari in the end. All of those are very threatening things, and yet. You, you never hear VP Lenny talk about all of those things. Yeah. So I think yung ganong decorum should be established among vice presidents, especially one that would like to become president in the future. She should have that decorum. 
Now, if she does want to insist on talking about defense and security issues, then please talk about things that matter from, on a macro level perspective sa Pilipinas. Because right now, what she's doing is she's messaging China that, you know, they can distract the Philippines with all these domestic political disputes and they can, they, so that the country can care less about the West Philippine Sea issue. But we are divided amongst ourselves. And that's a very wrong messaging to China. Because right now, yung ginagawa niya that she's being quiet, um, re regardless ng nangyayari on the ground na we know water cannon na tayo, in involving the AFP chief of staff, wala pa rin siyang statement, you're actually sending a message to China, hey, China, I have your back, regardless of what you do. And that's a wrong message to send to China. In fact, if you want to have a genuinely independent foreign policy, what you should message China, to China is fit for that. Yeah. I will behave accordingly in response to how you behave to me. Right. That is how to, we should behave at the world stage level. We don't reciprocate things na hindi naman binibigay sa atin ng China. No? This is, yung, yung ginagawa ng mga Duterte at the moment to China really is yung itong unreciprocated love. No? Th that's really what it is, right. cheesy as it sounds. No? Hindi, hindi binabalik ang pagmamahal ng mga Duterte sa China. China has not reciprocated that in investments, obviously not in in, in military well, postures. Or let me Philippe correct Philippe. you, maybe not reciprocated to the nation of the Philippines, but maybe on certain other level there was a reciprocation we're not aware of. I'm, ju I'm just saying. <laughs> which, is, which, which is all the more a shame, right? Well, exactly, you know, which is... Which, and, you know, China, mm. and I would like to address that point. You know, China likes to tout that, no, na we have made many investments in Mindanao, etc. Pero yun nga yung point eh, kaya nga tignan mo itong coalition ni Marcos na yan, many of whom are Luzon people, they don't, that, that, that don't benefit from all these China investments. Kasi nga, China is only rewarding yung mga, yung mga friendly voices sa kanya in the Philippines. So, because of that strategy, very transactional mm. approach ng China, it cannot win the entire Philippines over, right? So, what does it tell you about the China policy sa Philippines? That China policy in the Philippines ultimately requires on divide and conquer, right? Because China knows that it cannot win the public as a whole, no? So, talagang yung mga public opinion polls repeatedly yeah, yeah. tell you that... So, therefore, cooptation. Targeted yeah, cooptation, yeah. Yeah. So, that already tells us a lot about the nature of Chinese economic activity here in the Philippines. Ngayon, we don't need to go to war with them and all these really ridiculous escalatory actions that are being suggested by some people that na yun daw yung mangyayari if we, if we stop um, cooperating with China and so forth. Um, you know, that's not really going to happen. And I do think that fundamentally, if we have to stand up to China, we have to start doing it now. Because right. yung credible deterrence, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a, it's a result of repeated behavior. And we have to do it now. And to be frank, I think, um, for example, there were some people who were raising na we should desecuritize this issue, right, with with China. We should we should maintain good relations with them. Some of them coming onto TV. You know, government officials in the Philippines are not stupid. It's not that easy, no? Kung ganun siya kadali, that we mm. just have good relations with China, and suddenly all of our problems with them are going to be resolved, then, my goodness, we should have done, we should have had peaceful relations with China since 2016, but we haven't, no? 2019 to 2021, even Duterte admitted that there were some security concerns right. with China. And what does it tell you, no? Just for the viewers, simply put, yung problems natin with China are structural, not cyclical. Kasi kung cyclical lang yan, it can be resolved by yeah. goodwill. It can be resolved by changing the policy of the administration. Eh, nakita na nga natin eh, magpalit ka ng policy, Duterte to Marcos, Aquino to Duterte, you still face the same things, no? Harassment in the West Philippine Sea, some dubious Chinese innocent passage malapit sa Cebu, ah, sa, sa, sorry, not Cebu, sa Sulu, and also in the Benham Rice, no? Which is a recently claimed uh, Philippine, legally claimed Philippine um, area as well. So, what does that tell you? I think we need right. to have a very consistent foreign policy and it needs to be a product of concerted, deliberate defense and security effort. We cannot turn away from these problems. Hindi ako agree dyan sa narrative na yan na 
you just need to be friendly with them somehow all of our problems will be resolved that is a very ridiculous approach no and, and, and the question is okay operationally what are you saying let's just give away Scott second Thomas show let's just get like you exactly. know like you push them what do you what are you exactly saying here See, they cannot exactly. they cannot say that no let's so don't give me motherhood state motherhood statement is not a Jew it's not a national security doctrine you know it's it's just like saying you know I mean like the kind of stuff giving enemies a friend to all enemy to none is punk tourism that's the, the part of tourism should uh, you know that should that cannot be a DFA <laughs> slogan it's a tourism slogan all right thank you so much Justin uh, Bakisal for that fantastic discussion Really appreciate it and looking forward for the rest of our gang to come Thank together you. and discuss more of this. Salamat. Salamat. And good night. Good night. Justin, one second. Can we do a five minute lang ulitin natin yung ASEAN part just in sure. case lang na, na wala? Because I don't know what which happened. Was, which was this again? Sorry. Akong bala. Okay. Uh, Sorry about it. Just in case lang na wala. Uh, very quick. Sorry. We can make it like a short slang. Just a key point. Sorry. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Okay, Justin. Um... Obviously, we talked about the deafening silence of the Dutertes or Vice President Duterte, who has opinion on a whole host of issues from Gaza to peace process and so on and so forth, but very quiet on, on the latest bullying incident in the second Thomas Scholl in West Philippine Sea. But the other one, deafening silence, is from ASEAN. So which raises the question, what's going on with ASEAN? Is ASEAN useless? Is ASEAN north of useless or south of useless? Or is this about... ASEAN 10 being separated from dealing bilaterally and minilaterally or ASEAN minus one with, let's say, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, etc. Because my argument always was there's really not much we can expect from ASEAN 10 aside from going through the motions of code of conduct negotiations. Like, you know, in the 20 years that we are negotiating this code of conduct, China has built, I don't know, hundreds of new cities and airports and, and all of that, right? Um, good luck, right? Um, I think... I think the concern there is we're actually enabling uh, the change of the facts on the ground through going through these motions, this cult of discourse and cult of process over outcome. But I do believe that there's a value in reaching out to ASEAN on a minilateral, bilateral level, because I think at the very least you would have expected Malaysia, Singapore, you know, Indonesia, to say something at this even, not even cryptically, but a little bit more indirectly about, hey, don't do that to a founding member. Hey, you know, we have to uh, not even name China, but say something. I mean, making a statement at the level of foreign ministry, you don't need the consensus of 10 countries. It's just an executive decision in accordance to the interests of the region. How, how, what do you think about okay. that? Uh, okay, okay. Ito, I'll be frank. No? I, I mean, we already know that dito tayo medyo na differ na opinion. I think ako, very traditional Filipino defense establishment yung view ko on ASEAN na if we're being very frank about it, na hindi naman, they will not, they will never call out China very publicly. So at the very least, what um, what what ASEAN can do is to step aside and not comment so much on Philippine defense policy. Mm. I think jan nang nagaling yung skepticism ng Philippine de defense establishment sa ASEAN, kasi some some leaders within Southeast Asian states na nagiging tactless sila when it comes to commenting about um, South China Sea dispute. So they keep on saying that. You know, we should have good relations with China and so forth. We should not be provoking um, China. And so they're frankly, gaslighting us. That's what you're saying. They're they're blaming us for for defending our own sovereign rights. I actually think I, I would I would say na hindi naman nila intend yon. They just they're just stating their strategic outlook. Ganon talaga. Eh. I mean, that's the strategic culture of Indonesia to try to be as neutral as it can and so yeah. forth. No? no foreign bases um, whatsoever. So th that's really their defense policy historically, and we have to respect that. Ngayon, it, nagkakaroon siya ng problema kasi domestically sa Philippines. Yeah. Whenever a foreign leader mentions a statement like that, they interpret that or they twist it to mean that the Marcos administration foreign policy is wrong. They also did that to President Aquino, right, when we took China to court in 2013-2016. So, in, in short, um, ASEAN has two problems. Number one, it has the problem of that misperception that not only is it staying quiet, but that it is actively interfering or commenting on Philippine affairs. And then secondly, parang ang nangyayari kasi in the past 10 years, ASEAN has not only been neutral, it has sort of been an impediment to the effective conduct of Philippine uh, foreign policy, which is a founding member state. So for example, China was able to divide ASEAN on on issue yung mga joint communiques ng ASEAN when it comes to South China Sea dispute. That happened before. China is able to drag on itong discussion ng code of conduct because there are some China-friendly countries in the Philippines in ASEAN like Cambodia. So 
ang nangyayari tuloy, ASEAN is being weaponized against the Philippines. Mm. So let's not be under the illusion that it's not as if that the Philippines is the rogue actor here and that ASEAN is trying to kick some sanity into the Philippines. Actually, from the perspective of the Philippines, there are things that China has to improve on. From the Philippine perspective, ang nagiging dating, nagagamit ang ASEAN against right. Philippine interest. And the core principle of ASEAN, di ba, is non-interference. You should not touch on the core national security interests of your founding member states. And they should be true to their word to stick to that and not try to you know, meddle in Philippine defense policy um, too much. And I think because of that reasoning, some people in the defense establishment here in the Philippines, they have taken, parang they gave up on ASEAN. Talagang, this is useless anyway. We will just sidestep ASEAN. And that is a challenge for ASEAN to step up. No? And right. as we've discussed, na maybe the, the solution is yung ASEAN minus approach. No? So I'm a bit skeptical on whether they will issue a statement in support of the Philippines or medyo kahit indirect condemnation pa nga of China. I'm skeptical of it. But they can start with practical measures like right. um, yung joint patrols in the South China Sea, for example. We can work that out, maybe not with ASEAN as an institution, but maybe hopefully countries like Indonesia, or Malaysia, um, Vietnam can help us conduct those. And it's very important kasi we have to balance out the defense portfolio, defense cooperation portfolio of the Philippines. No? Na hindi, tama nga naman, hindi lang dapat Australia, US, Japan yung partners natin. Which by the way, all of those are partners under the US Hubs and Spokes model. Yeah, so, that's why I'm saying, uh, Justin, optics matter, right? Because yeah, if, if, if the support is just coming from these countries, then it, it, it makes it easier for this pro-Beijing propaganda to say, oh, Philippines is the Ukraine, right? They're just exactly. the tip of the NATO knife's edge pointing at, oh, victim China, right? But when India says something, that, that that's good. When Vietnam says something, that's kind of good because these are not seen as Western lackeys or part of the U.S. Hub and Spokes Alliance or Western nations. So, feeling for as an optics, matter of optics, that's important. But but my my, my fundamental point, because here, Justin is again, maybe this is Carino brutal. This is tough love. Is you know, just like Marcos Jr., if ASEAN is conflict avoidant and just become you know a uh, <laughs> passive actor or completely non-central, to put it nicely, and if peripheral, they're gonna invite conflict. They're gonna invite in uh, gr great power interventions, and it's gonna achieve the complete opposite of what ASEAN wants to achieve. <coughs> Sorry. Exactly. Um, it's a, th that's a good point, though. I'd like to raise itong sa historical context nga ng ASEAN that. You know, during the Cold War, ASEAN, the ASEAN member states supported military action in mainland Southeast Asia against, for example, like yung Pol Pot Vietnam versus Vietnam, Vietnam right? Vietnam, yeah. exactly. Even Singapore, no, si Lee Kuan Yew, if I recall correctly, he actually supported that military action and his right. reason was very simple, balance of power, right? If the Vietnamese became too powerful, it would threaten the security of mainland Southeast right. Asia. So it's not as if Southeast Asian leaders or Southeast Asia, ASEAN as an organization is incapable of taking concrete actions. So where does the problem lie? I think the problem lies in over time the mellow down yung some ASEAN states and they equate diplomacy as the lack of military action. Right. In, fact, in terms of statecraft, military action in diplomacy they go are together. Tool, yeah. Are tools to the same ends, right? The pursuit of national security. So, ito argument that we should just keep on talking with China and so forth, not mutually exclusive show with standing up for ourselves. This is really one of the great lies being propagated, undoubtedly by China, even within ASEAN, no? portraying the Philippines as yeah. the Ukraine, we're provoking the conflict, and so forth. So I think even within ASEAN, some of our neighbors also have to learn that um, go back to your roots. That's really what it is. You go back to the roots of ASEAN, Na, hindi naman talaga, it's not true that ASEAN is just a talking shop. Maybe recently it's becoming a talking yeah. shop. But we are not yet at that point in time na it's completely irreversible, right? So what ASEAN is what the member states make of it. And I hope that um, they can take concrete actions, such as those that we've mentioned um, in this show earlier today, they can take yeah. those actions um, to firmly at least help the Philippines or mitigate uh, the tensions. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I always said, if you look at the history of ASEAN itself, I mean, there are all of these 
amateurs out there who think they're ASEAN experts. A lot of them in Europe, other countries say, oh, ASEAN has no history of intervention, blah, blah, blah. Look at what they've doing. Like, I would say, like, you know, by, by that yardstick, you know, like, EU is also a useless institution. It's not, what have they done, you know, like, direct... It, they are always waiting for U.S. or NATO or something. But my point is, again, yes, uh, uh, when there was concern with Vietnamese revanchism and a kind of greater Vietnam, they step in. And, well, this was horrible because they supported the Pol Pot regime in exile. But later on, it was more positive. They pushed Hun Sen post into China wars to form a kind of a coalition, pluralistic government. We see Hanuk and more leftists and progressive forces. Uh, and then later on in East Timor, right, when there was a transition, difficult transition process on a minilateral level, you know, uh, ASEAN countries went in because, of course, Indonesia was conflicted about this issue. Um, so Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia supported peacekeeping efforts and ASEAN was very helpful. So actually, we have history when we had strong leaders, uh, ASEAN was very effective. But at the same time, you cannot always rely on strong leaders. You need strong institutions. And that's what didn't happen. Once the Mahathirs and Lee Kuan Yews and Sukarnos and Marcuses and Ramoses were gone and we were left with mediocre leaders, nothing happened because the institutions were not built. So the chicken and egg problem is still there. But I, I, I will always make this point. I still believe the Philippines has to reach out to other ASEAN countries on a minilateral level. Uh, I think soon President Marcus Jr. will be visiting for me, the most important partner we can have on the South China Sea issue in the region. Let's see how that goes. Uh, and, uh, you know, we may not get 10 out of 10, but I think even if we get four or five out of 10, that's good, including on optics, because you just don't want 30 European, Jap Japanese, American, Canadian just supporting us. You want a bunch of people who are not uh, part of the so-called West, right? Because that allows us also to push back against this Chinese propaganda or pro-China propaganda. No, Philippines is just the Ukraine of Asia trying to, you know, to bully us, China. And because they're victims, just like Putin's Russia. Siya pang victim yan, di ba? That's the interesting dynamic that we have to push back. Thank you very much, Justin, on this discussion. We went way overboard. But that's what always happens when we talk about things we are passionate in the bot and we are passionate about nothing less than our national interest. Salamat, Justin, for joining us again. Justin Bakisal. Hopefully, Happy next meeting, we can have the rest of the gang, but we needed this timely discussion. So we'll be posting it on this different platforms. I'll be tagging you and uh, looking forward to more of this discussion. Have a good night, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Magandang gabi sa Salamat. Mabuhay ka. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Sorry, pinauli din. Nagkakaroon ng problema. Yeah, si Justin Bakisal is... Uh, expert on West Philippines. He used to work at the Department of National Defense. He knows his stuff. He's a great guy. Uh, and this is part of the other podcast I set up, which is, you know, with millennial, young, next generation leaders uh, talking about South China Sea, West Philippines issues. So also check that. Uh, I call it Pod Para Sabayan, right? Para Pod Save America. That's, that's my version of that. Thank you for that. God bless and